Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cold Calling is Dead, or is it? Warm up to cold calling this winter. I'm the marketing manager here at Intronus. I'm pleased to be joined by Jonathan Almonte and Carrie Simpson. Carrie is the founder of Managed Sales Pros, a lead generation firm dedicated to providing new business opportunities for MSPs. Carrie helps IT firms to build, manage, and grow their sales pipelines. Jonathan is an account executive at Intronus. His experience includes cold calling IT providers like you to identify potential new partners for Intronus. During today's session, we'll hear about some of the most common objections IT providers have against cold calling and learn about some of the benefits of including cold calling in your sales process. Then we will share some best practices on how your company can cold call with the do-it-yourself approach or by outsourcing it to a firm that will hit the ground running and save you a few headaches. Before we get started, let's do some brief housekeeping. During the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to share them using the questions or chat panels to the right of your GoToWebinar screen. If we ask poll questions, which I suspect we will, you can use the GoToWebinar panels to respond to those as well. At the end of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a survey, and we ask that you take a moment to tell us what you think in that survey so that we can continually improve the content and quality of online events like this one. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to today's presenters for a valuable lesson on cold calling. Carrie, take it away. Hi there, folks. It looks like Carrie dropped her audio, but I assure you we'll get her right back on. So sorry about the technical difficulties. Give us just oh. about... Oh, there you are. Yep, All right. There I am. <laughs> Good. I wasn't sure how I'd buy more time, Carrie, but I'm glad to hear you. So. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> sorry. Take it away, Carrie. That was a really great intro. I'm sorry you guys missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so like Jeff mentioned, my name is Carrie Simpson. I'm the CEO of Managed Sales Pros. We've been cold calling into the managed services vertical specifically and exclusively for the last couple of years, but I have over 20 years of experience designing cold calling programs for IT companies, and I'm happy to share some of that experience with you today. The first thing I want to talk about is reasons why you're not currently using cold calling to build your IT services practice. The thing that we hear most often from clients is, I am too busy to do that. Now, I'm a small business owner myself. We have 35 employees here. And I guarantee you that I never get to leave the office 100% finished with my work for the day. And I'm sure that all of you experience the same thing. You are never going to leave the office with your work 100% done, but you can go out of business with your pipeline 100% empty. I encourage you to take a little time every day to do some outbound prospecting. Even if you can only spare an hour, that is going to impact your bottom line at the end of the year. The next objection we often hear is, I don't have the right tools for that. And honestly, if you're making 15,000 cold calls a month like we do, you're going to need a robust CRM to handle that kind of volume. But as a small business owner, scraping aside one hour a day to do cold calling, you're going to make about 10 dials a day. You don't need anything fancy to manage 10 dials a day. You've got a pen and a piece of paper and the internet. That's all you're going to need. Um, if you're already using a PSA, you can use your PSA to manage your outbound cold calling, and that's a really great idea because then you're going to have the ability to look at the life cycle of your prospects from the minute you engage with them all the way through to when you finish doing business with them. And I'm sure that Autotask would be happy to tell you more about that. We also hear a lot on about referrals here, and people come to us saying, we built our business on referrals, we don't need to cold call. Quite often companies come to us when they've, been, they've experienced that kind of influx of referrals or leads uh, for a long period of time, and then suddenly they just dry up. They don't have them anymore. So referrals are free. 
they are a gift and they aren't a long-term business development strategy because you too could experience those dry spells where those referrals just stop coming. And if you haven't built a solid sales pipeline, you may experience multiple quarters where you don't sign any new business and that's not good for anybody. So the next point is uh, one that we feel really strongly about here and that's that cold calls bother people and they don't want negative attention being drawn to their brand. So Jonathan, what has your reception to cold calling been? When you're cold calling out on behalf of Intronus, how are people reacting to that? Yeah, and you know, the MSPs that I speak to, they really don't mind. I mean, those that I particularly reach out to tell me politely if they're not interested. Uh, more times than not, it does take a few touches before I get a response back. And they're more than anything appreciating the persistence. I've had prospects tell me that they wish I was working for them if I was part of their sales team. Um, I really don't see it being bothersome. They'll tell you right off the bat if it is. Great. So from, a from, a from the perspective of somebody that you're cold calling out to, I want you to think about cold calling essentially being an extension of how you currently network. So you wouldn't think twice about going to a network event, going to your Chamber of Commerce event, or going to a dinner party, passing out your business card, and talking to them about how, they, how you could provide value to their organization. Cold calling is essentially just networking done on the phone, and it's 10 times more efficient. You're going to be able to reach a whole lot more people cold calling than you ever would be going to a 30-seat networking luncheon. And my favorite one is cold calling is dead, and that's why we named the webinar after this. And uh, my response to that is always, I wish somebody had told me that cold calling is dead before I started this cold calling company. And I guess I'll just go and cry into the enormous pile of money I made cold calling for MSPs last year. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out how to use this, so pardon me. So cold calling is not dead, but it is a lot of hard work. So the total number of MSP calls that we made in January of this year is almost 14,000. And the number of appointments scheduled in, in January for our MSP clients was 43. So if you're doing the quick math backwards on that, for every one qualified appointment, we have to make 300 phone calls. So it is a lot of hard work, but it does pay off. The industry standard used to be about one in 100. So you would make 100 calls for every one appointment that you would get. As technology has changed a bit, people are screening their calls a bit more, those numbers have gone up, but it still pays off. So in January, we added almost 900 desktops and over 100 servers worth of opportunities to our clients' pipeline for an average deal of about 20 seats and two servers. That's a perfect managed services opportunity, especially for an organization that is just moving in to that recurring revenue market. So I think, Jeff, it's time for an audience poll. That's right. It sure is, Carrie. Uh, this is our first audience poll of the day. So folks, please take a look at the GoToWebinar screen. You should um, see right here the question. And the question is, how many leads are you currently generating in-house every week? Answer choices are 0, 1 to 5, 5 to 10, or 10 or more leads being generated in-house. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and click a button here that's going to push this poll out onto your screen so that you can actually submit your response. And I uh, encourage you all to participate, and then we'll take a look at your answers in just about 30 seconds. So uh, Carrie, as we give these folks um, about 30 seconds to submit their responses, and I see them flying in as we speak, um, what would your best guess be? What, what do you think we're going to see here? I'm going to say that uh, most MSPs are going to be generating between one and five a week. Jonathan, I know you've got some bias here because you just heard Carrie's response, but, but how do you feel? I and mean, what do you think MSPs typically see in terms of leads per week being generated by their own teams? Well, you know, it definitely depends on how many or how large their sales staff is or marketing or however you wanted to look at that. But I would say the B and C range are probably going to be most seen here. More so B, I would say. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and we'll take a look at the responses to see how they stack up. All right. And we can see that 
of the folks on this call are generating zero per week. So um, certainly, you know, in some respects, glad that we have some folks on the call that, that are uh, seeing those kinds of results because we hope to be able to help them uh, bring some more leads in and, and grow their businesses with those. Uh, one to five, the B answer, uh, Jonathan and Carrie, you're both spot on there. It seems like most folks are generating one to five per week, and some are doing a really awesome job with five to ten and, and ten plus uh, at six percent for five to ten and, and you know, four percent at tens plus. But it looks like roughly 70 percent of folks are, are one to five. So it was a good guess. Uh, good guess, or uh, I would call it uh, educated, since both of you work in this business. <laughs> We do talk to a lot of MSPs about how they, what kind of results they're achieving before they engage with us. Sounds so like now, a conversation I know from working with Jonathan, that's what he does a lot of the time, is learn about folks' business before we start talking about our product, because usually it's, uh, you know, ideally we want to make sure that we're a fit, and it sounds like you do too. So, um, But I'll keep, keep the rest of my thoughts to myself, and I'll hand it back <laughs> to you, Carrie, to, to keep moving. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about one of our success stories now. So Copper Tree Solutions is a six-person IT firm located in Waterloo, Ontario. And for those of you who don't understand Canadian geography, that's about two hours outside of Toronto. And they're generating under $1 million in sales. Their CEO is the only sales rep. And they were interested in growing their monthly recurring revenue, which is why they reached out to us. So when we engaged with them, like 20% of the people who just responded to the poll, they were generating zero leads every week. And that was you know, with a fully SEO optimized website. They were trying everything they could. The only thing they weren't doing was cold calling. And with the CEO being the only sales rep, they didn't have the amount of time it was going to take them to go to the market. So they engaged with us and we, start, we're, we started producing over 10 leads a week for them. And in 10 weeks, they had so many leads that they weren't able to keep up with the volume, and they had to ask us to turn off the tap. But Jonathan, how would adding 10 new leads a week affect your numbers this year? For me personally, I would definitely like 10 extra leads a week. Uh, that seems like it would be a great problem to have. And how about your clients? I would say the exact same for them. <laughs> I think it is a nice problem to have. So. Another audience poll, Jeff? Sure, thanks, Carrie. Uh, this one asks, approximately how many sales appointments does your team schedule on a consistent basis? So on a typical time frame, would you say that you schedule one appointment per month, one appointment per week, or more than two appointments per week? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll just like we did before, and uh, you can submit your response right into the GoToWebinar interface. Kelly, what's your take on this? What do you think we'll see? I'm going to say one per week. And how about you, Jonathan? One per week as well. All right, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most folks um, probably are scheduling one per month. Um, I'm not really out on a limb. I'm actually looking at the responses as they come in. <laughs> That's uh, cheating. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we've got most people voted, and I will close this poll and launch it, the results so that we can take a look at them and discuss. And it looks like 40% of the respondents, or folks on the call today, are generating one scheduled appointment per month, 33% schedule one appointment per week, and 27% are scheduling more than two per week, so those folks are certainly keeping their sales staff busy. Um, what do you think of these results, Carrie? Well, I'm actually surprised that there are uh, so many people scheduling only one per month, uh, but that makes sense for a smaller firm where they're perhaps busy with their current client base and don't always have the time to focus on uh, looking for that new business. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and I'll hide this uh, so that you can get back right into your presentation. Okay, so I'm going to review another success story from this year, looking at sales appointments rather than leads. We work with an organization called the Lanair Group, and they are a 40-employee, multi-location, pure play MSP. So they do not engage with uh, a customer unless there is a signed monthly recurring revenue contract on the table. And the reason I wanted to share this case study with you is to show you the difference between both organizations. Cold calling will work for small firms and it will work for large firms. So Lanier is currently receiving two sales appointments every week in a very competitive market. So all of the larger cities are quite saturated with competing MSPs, all of them clawing for the same pieces of business. 
Uh, they were quite skeptical of cold calling before engaging with us, but now, after seeing the results after the first two months of their cold calling program, they're planning to roll it out in multiple markets. So if anybody's looking at the long-term business goal of going to that pure play MSP, uh, cold calling will help you build your business as well. So now that we've talked a little bit about cold calling, I think everybody's going to leave this webinar today and they're going to do one of these six things. Either you're going to leave here today and you're going to do nothing, you're going to change nothing, and you know, that's all right. Um, we have a saying around here, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you always get. So looking at the poll results from the last question, one sales appointment a month is not going to keep your pipeline full. So I would encourage you to really look at cold calling as a viable option. And the rest of these suggestions are ways that you could bring cold calling into your firm. So you could do it yourself. And I'm here to share some information with you and a few tips, tricks, techniques, best practices that we use internally so that you can take that to the market. We also have a, uh, a book that we're happy to share with you. Um, if you're currently subscribed to our newsletter, you know that we're in the middle of an eight-week series on how to pitch managed services to different decision makers. We have that in a PDF, and if you want to email me at hello at managedsalespros.com, that information will be at the end of the webinar. I'm happy to share that book with you. One of the challenges of doing it yourself is going to be, uh, as we've already discussed, finding the time to do it and some opportunity costs. So knowing what you bill out an hour, hourly, I mean, I know what I bill out every hour. For example, I bill out at a higher rate than my accountant does. I could try to save a few bucks by doing my own accounting, but at the end of the day, what I'm losing is billable hours that I could be uh, generating revenue with, and I'm not an expert in accounting, so it makes sense to me that I would hand off that piece of business to somebody who was. So you can make your current sales rep do it. If you're a larger MSP and you already have a sales team, you could mandate that uh, cold calling become part of their role. And I would argue that if the sales reps wanted to be cold calling, they would already be doing it. I think you're going to experience some change management there. And you're also paying your sales rep uh, probably a fairly reasonable salary, and he's become an expert in the products and services that you're offering. Is his time best spent talking to receptionists and gatekeepers, or is his time best spent cross-selling, upselling your current client base, and potentially going out on these new sales meetings? So you could hire a new sales rep and you could make it part of their role. And I'd like to share with you um, something that we learned this year. And I think it was probably the thing that helped our company grow the most this year. And we grew from four sales reps to 35 this year. So we did make a significant jump. And we did it working with an organization that helped us do personality profiling on our top sales lead generators. So we took the people that were consistently performing at a higher level than everyone else and we made them fill out a questionnaire to identify what the personality traits of a perfect lead generator look like. And then we cross-referenced that with the personality profile of the sales rep. I think a lot of people uh, usually look at lead generators as an entry-level role, and they are eventually going to nurture those people into an inside sales rep and then to an outside sales rep. And what we learned was that the personality profile of a sales rep and of a good lead generator uh, are completely contradictory. And if you uh, want to check out my blog at managedsalespros.com, there's a long article about how we did that and what we learned and what the differences in personality styles were. Again, happy to share that data with you, but what we learned was sales reps do not make good lead generators, and lead generators do not make good sales reps. They're motivated by completely different things. So you could hire your own lead generator, and uh, I will be the first one to say that that is always the best decision. You know, I'm obviously invested in the hire and outsource firm option, but if you can do this in-house, you should do it in-house. You are always going to have more control over a rep that's sitting in your office than you will over you know, a rep that's sitting in my office. The difference is being ramp time. So if you're going to look right now and start thinking about hiring a lead generator, I don't think you're going to get performance out of that person for about three quarters. And in that fourth quarter, they're going to start performing, and they will be a long-term valuable addition to your team, provided you can keep them motivated and incented and you know, properly support that person in that career choice. Hiring an outsource firm means plug and play, no wait time, no training, no hiring, no recruiting. So you eliminate some of the upfront expenses. But the trade-off, of course, as we all know, since you're selling uh, a managed service, is you're going to pay a higher fee monthly for that service without all the upfront expenses.
So assuming that some of you are going to leave here today and do it yourself, I uh, think you should first of all go out and watch the best cold calling movie of all time, which is Glenn Geary, Glenn Ross, and that's where this quote is from. Cold calling has changed a little bit since, uh, you know, back in the day of boiler rooms, but some of the sta we still have some staples that we abide by from day to day. So how do you start cold calling? You're going to start with your current client base. Don't go right away to a cold list of 100 seat opportunities that you'd like to win. Start with your current client base. Go to them and ask them for more business. Jonathan, do you have some suggestions on how the MSPs uh, on your client roster? Yeah, I mean, you have to keep in mind current partners of yours may have additional needs that when they first went to you for your service, you might not have had. As your business changes, so does theirs. Um, talking to those that are already familiar with you, it's going to be a lot easier than somebody you've never spoken to before, don't really know what you do, um, but somebody that is a current partner of yours, it's a great place to start and get acclimated to selling services that you offer over the phone, really getting the lingo down and where to use the pauses and where to do the certain um, handling the objections as well. And so this is also a great time to get on the phone and ask those clients that you haven't converted to manage contracts for that business. Asking for referrals is another great way to practice cold calling. Calling people that are already receptive to you to ask them who might be interested in also doing business with you, that's a great way to start getting used to having those conversations. Then you get to call those referrals and have a warm conversation with them. You can even have your clients make that introduction if that makes you more comfortable. From there, you can move on to your network. Poke around on LinkedIn. Whose business do you want? Who's connected to the people that you know? You've got another warm introduction into those organizations. And once you've exhausted all that, then it's time to start cold calling. By then, you should have your pitch down pat, and you should feel a whole lot more confident picking up that phone and talking to random people about the value that you're going to bring to their business. So who are you going to talk to? If you're only going to make you know, 10 to 20 calls a day, you really want to take high percentage shots, meaning focus on companies that are technology dependent and technology strategic. Here we really focus on professional services, companies where if there is downtime, they are losing billable hours by the minute and they are never going to be able to recover that time. Names don't really matter when you're cold calling, so don't get hung, on, hung up on not knowing who you need to speak with. When you call into an organization, a five-minute phone call is going to tell you everything you need to know about how you're going to sell to this organization. So I would encourage you to do more calling and less researching. You don't need to spend 20 minutes preparing for a call. You need to know the name of the company and the phone number for the company, and once you get on the phone, you're going to be able to learn everything else that you want. And I want you to think about talking to anybody who will take your call. Pitch anybody who will listen to you. Everybody in an organization is a decision maker, and I don't know one person in an organization whose life isn't vastly improved when technology problems are solved. One of the things that we like to say here is that when the CEO takes an idea to the office manager, it gets put out to tender. And when the office manager goes to the CEO with an idea, it gets implemented. So look at every position title in an organization as an opportunity to win that business, even if you don't feel that they have, you know, quote unquote, buying authority at the time. So what should you say in your pitch? I'm going to encourage you to create vertical specific elevator pitches that are tailored to your audience. So Jonathan, do you want to explain a little bit more about what I mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you have, you know, obviously if you're talking to somebody that needs, and they're in the medical field, or if they are, you know, a law firm, and, you know, speaking from experience here at Intronus, we have, you know, a lot of compliances as far as that we can abide by and sign VA agreements for our um, MSPs that they market our product to SMBs for. Um, I will most likely, more than not, uh, hit on you know HIPAA compliance if I'm talking to an MSP that does a lot towards um, you know their medical partners and that's their main vertical. I'm not going to be talking about you know PCI or FINRA compliance. It, it just doesn't make sense for them. Yep, talking to a law firm about how well you support dentists isn't going to be as valuable as talking to a law firm about how you support other law firms. 
you're going to tailor your message to your audience a little bit as well. So if you're going in at the office manager level, the conversation is going to be drastically different than the conversation that you're going to have with the CEO. And again, we've developed a, an ebook that approaches all the different points of entry for managed services cold calling, and I'm happy to share that with you after the event. Just send an email and I will uh, send it over to you in a PDF form. So you want to end your pitch with an open-ended question. And the next slide, I'm going to show you how that works. After that open-ended question, you're going to want to pause. So Jonathan and I were talking a little bit about the importance of that pause. Jonathan, you want to share a little bit about why that's so important? Yeah, so to tie into both of those, um, open-ended questions are, in my view, uh, the key to a successful conversation. You want your prospect to open up about potential hurdles they're facing now and what you have to offer that will help them succeed. And that ties directly into pausing. Uh, pausing is something everyone should take full advantage of, whether it's after asking a question, giving up some info on you or your business. Let it resonate with your prospect and get feedback anytime you can. You want them to be talking as much as they can. Okay, so I'm going to just throw up the slide here. This is a, a basic introduction that we use. I mean, we tailor our pitch for the clients that we work with, but this, is, in a nutshell, is what we find successful calling here. So it goes something like this. It's Carrie calling from ABC IT in Winnipeg. We work with small businesses to help them improve their computer networks. We specialize in working with law firms, and I'd like to come in and spend some time on site with your team to see if we could help you in any way. 123 Law Firm reduced their IT hardware spend by over 30% last year, and all of our clients like our one-hour callback guarantee. How many computers do you have on site there? So you can see I go right from the sales pitch into that open-ended question. And there's, you can make a list of open-ended questions that you can ask, but the goal there is to, instead of tell it, having them say, I'm not interested and hang up the phone right away, you want to get them talking about what their current requirements are. So some of the other questions you can ask are, who do you currently call when your network goes down? And you can identify who they're working with right now, and you'll know who you're pitching against. Or who would I talk to to schedule a site visit? And that's an important question, because that's going to tell you who holds the keys to the kingdom. So you're going to want to qualify that lead. I do not want to drive an hour and a half across town to meet with somebody that is absolutely not going to purchase something from me. So how do you qualify uh, a good managed services lead? So first you want to find out, are they technology dependent? So about six months ago, we scheduled an opportunity for a client that on the surface looks like the perfect managed services opportunity. They had 40 computers, and they had six servers, and they were considering some virtualization, and they worked in a disaster recovery uh, firm. So they, I mean, it was a really good fit for um, all kinds of different backup solutions. And through the course of the conversation, you know, at the beginning, we were really excited. This is going to be great. Our client's going to be so happy. Then we learned that the CEO's laptop broke six weeks ago. They sent it out for service, and it hadn't been returned to them. So at that point, I want to think, well, how technology dependent is this organization if somebody as important as the CEO can survive without a computer for six weeks? What are they actually using their computers for? Is everybody just running Word on their computers? So really try to dig in a little bit and find out, do they rely on technology to get their jobs done there? Because the more reliant on technology they are, the more likely it is that they're going to see the value in managed services. How many computers are there? Now, if they've got fewer than 20 computers, I don't know if you want to go down that road. The, uh, the 10 to 20 space um, are easy meetings to get and hard deals to close. So in my experience, if a company hasn't hit the point where they're already outsourcing or it already makes sense to them to outsource, you're going to have an uphill, ha uphill battle to sell to that organization. You want to find out what happens now when something isn't working. So that's going to tell you, you know, who are they currently working with? Do they have one IT guy or do they have a team of people? What happens when something shuts down? What changes are they considering? If this company's moving, it's going to be a great fit. Are they adding headcount? What's going on in that organization? And then who's involved with the manager of the computer network right now? This is a great question. This is going to help you find out if it's you know the CEO's brother's uncle's cousin's hairdresser's son who's doing their IT support. And uh, maybe with an embedded provider, you're not going to pitch as aggressively as you might because you're going to be pitching against someone that they know and like. And they, how much support did they need last month? So that's a really great way of saying how much are you spending on IT. 
if you find out all they need every month is $50 worth of support, you're never going to convert them to a $150 a desktop managed services agreement. So you're going to come up against objections. Here are some of the major ones. Uh, we already have that. We're too big for that or we're too small to need that. We're not interested or we just signed an agreement with X. And we have some uh, objection handling techniques for all of those. And again, I keep mentioning the book, but we do review all of those in that book. And if you'd like to get a copy of that, please just reach out to me after this webinar. So here are some things that you're going to want to watch out for. Are you talking too much? So we monitor calls here regularly. And quite often, I will hear a sales rep get a meeting and then talk themselves out of the meeting. At some point, you need to just stop talking and let the prospect do all the talking. It feels awkward when you first start doing it, but once you get used to it and learn where to pause, you're going to find that you're going to be more successful. Are you talking too quickly? And I am always guilty of this. And I mean, we're fortunate that we can monitor all of our calls in real time and record them. So I can always go back and say, yeah, that's where the wheels came off the bus. Of course, they couldn't hear what you were saying. You were talking a mile a minute. So one of the ways that we get new callers to practice is by calling their answering machines and pitching their answering machines. When you can hear what you're saying, it really helps you figure out where you should be pausing. So I'd encourage you while you're practicing your pitch, while you're you know, going through the networking portion of the getting ready to cold call, call your answering machine and start delivering your pitch a couple of times a day and then see, see how it improves. The next one, uh, are you awkwardly filling up silences? So Jonathan, you had a lot to say about pausing earlier. Where do you find this happens the most? Awkwardly filling up silences, I feel as though that comes up quite a bit. And when I was first starting cold calling, that was something that I did a lot of. I said, um, perfect, okay, great, probably a thousand times a call. Or at least that's what it felt like. Um, and there it is again. <laughs> you <laughs> need to you need to really, you know, narrow that down. Just be silent. Let let the silence go. With every second of silence, and we've had sales trainers come into it us too. With every second of silence, you just get more and more power and more control over that conversation. Yeah, that's old school sales training. So when I first started cold calling 20 years ago, I sold vacuum cleaners for Filter Queen. So should I date myself a little bit there. But the, the way that they taught you to sell was like the first person that talks loses. And we don't really look at sales as a competition anymore. It's changed over the last 20 years to become we're looking for win-win partnerships. But that point is still very much alive today. When you speak, when you ask a question, stop talking. Let them think. Let them answer. When you ask for a meeting, for example, when you ask them to meet with you, stop talking. Let them find a time that they can meet with you. You really need to let them think about what you're saying. And are you using too much tech speak? And I think everyone gets a little guilty of this, especially if their background is quite technical. But your client or your prospect likely isn't a technical person. And they don't, if they stop understanding what you're talking about, you're going to lose them people start to feel overwhelmed. So I have a good example of this. We recently you know, became a, a size of company that became attractive to managed services. We have an office in Las Vegas. We had to hire 20 people to fill that office and we had to choose our own managed service provider to do it. I had multiple people come in and pitch that business. People, the first people we uh, discounted were the ones that we'd called who had treated us badly in previous calls. But the ones that uh, you know, we knew and liked came in and one company pitched me in plain English, something that I understood. I mean, yeah, I sell managed services, but I do not have an IT background. The other company came in and used a lot of words I didn't understand. They suggested things that sounded really complicated to me and they didn't clarify anything. And at the end of the day, although the, the programs were both priced competitively and I trusted both organizations, I went with the firm that I understood, where they, they spoke to me in language that I understood, where I understood what my computer network was going to do, I understood how much it was going to cost, and uh, at the end of the day, that was, that was what helped push me over the edge. I was overwhelmed in the other side. Like, he left and I thought, wow, I don't know anything. And you don't want to leave your prospect feeling overwhelmed. You want them feeling confident that they're about to make a great decision working with a firm like yours. 
So are you asking closed-ended questions? If you're finding that your conversations are very short all the time, I would wager that you are probably asking questions that can be answered yes or no. And any time a prospect can say no, the conversation is over. So make a list of those open-ended questions and keep it by your phone when you're dialing so that when the conversation stops, you can always find a question to ask next. And the last one, are you trying to sell your services or are you trying to sell the meeting? So nobody is going to buy IT from you over the phone. All you want to do is get in front of them so you can demonstrate to them how you're going to bring value to their company and why you are the best choice for this decision. You don't need to sell them everything in your arsenal. All you need to do is get in front of them and talk to them. So really think about convincing them to meet with you versus trying to sell them everything all at once. So how do you get the meeting? Well, the first way to get a meeting is to ask for it. And never ask, would you like to meet? Because that becomes a closed-ended question. I like to go in assuming that they are going to meet with me, suggest a couple of times that are available, and then let them pick the one that works best for them. And then, Jonathan, this goes back to silence. Wait for them to answer. I like to get that meeting calendared right while they're on the phone with you. So to, while you're talking to them, in here you can talk to them like a person, not a sales rep. So when I'm calendaring a meeting with someone, I want them to pop open their Outlook. I'm going to open mine. We're going to talk a little bit while we both find an available time. And here's where I like to become a human to them. Talk about your kids. Talk about your hockey game or the hockey game. Talk about anything that makes them think that you might be a person that they'd like to have a beer with sometime or someone who's you know, a real person versus just some guy that they're going to blow off if they don't feel like meeting with you that day. You really want them to feel that you might be someone that they could relate to. So I would encourage you at this point to just be casual and let your personality come through a little bit. So why should you outsource your cold calling? We touched on this a little bit before. Opportunity cost. Your time is valuable, especially if you're doing everything in your organization. I think your time could be better spent in billable hours or working on your business instead of working in your business. Consistency. As much as you may leave here today thinking that you're going to commit two hours a day to cold calling every day for the rest of your business, something's going to happen. Clients will have emergencies. And a week and a half later, you're not going to be any further ahead than you were today. Process or process, depending on what country you're in, is something that outsourcing brings to the table. They already have a tried and true proven way of doing things. You don't have to invent that. So you're not starting from zero. No ramp time. You know, you can outsource your cold calling today and it can be performing tomorrow. So for either permanently or temporarily while you're finding and training that perfect hire. So remember we talked about that a little bit earlier. Doing it in-house is always going to be the best option if you can do it that way. It makes sense to work with an organization that can uh, provide you with some immediate results while you're looking for that person. So, and here's the gratuitous slide, why should you outsource to us? Well, because we're here talking with you for Intronus, so we're really heavily engaged with the vendor community and we're learning how to sell your stuff from the people that are selling it to you. So we already have callers that are trained to the value proposition who understand the things that you're providing your clients and who are able to speak intelligently to them. There is no learning curve with managed sales pros. And because nobody hates us yet, <laughs> I think that if you speak to um, people in your social network who have been engaged with us, whether their campaign was uh, you know, phenomenally good or astronomically bad, everybody would say that we were a good company to do business with. We have uh, short engagements, so we require a 90-day commitment and then we go month to month after that time. We feel like we need to earn your business every month. There's nothing long-term. There are no startup fees. We offer highly qualified meetings using all of the techniques that we just reviewed, and we offer a high amount of transparency. So we don't put up any barriers between you and the person making your phone calls. You are welcome to engage with them and any other member of your calling team as often as you like. And the deliverables after a three-month pilot with managed sales pros includes a full sales pipeline, all the actionable follow-ups, and a clean prospecting database. So that's all I have right now. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Jeff? Yeah, hi, thanks, Carrie. Um, you know, I think it was a very, very interesting, very educational presentation. I learned a lot about the cold calling process and 
don't expect to ever be doing cold calls for a living, but ha if I were to start an IT firm, I think I'd seriously consider some of the advice you gave. Um, you know, before we dive right into questions, I would like to thank a few organizations who have uh, helped us present this webinar today. To start with, Intronus provides an industry-leading backup and disaster recovery solution that's purpose-built to help IT providers like you protect your customers' laptops, virtual machines, servers, and more. With cutting-edge, flat-rate pricing and outstanding support from our Boston-based partner success team, Intronus partners are destined for success. To learn more about Intronus packages and pricing plans, visit intronus.com slash no limits today. I'd like to continue to tell you about a couple of these organizations, but I just want to remind you that you can go ahead and submit your questions using the questions panel on the right side of your screen. We've got several questions come in, and we will get to those. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment just to thank Carrie again and to mention that her firm, Managed Sales Pros, as was just, just covered on the previous slide, is a, a firm that can help you with your cold calling efforts. And I encourage you to reach out to them if you'd like to learn more about hiring cold calling experts to add some fuel to your sales pipelines. And for those who prefer the do-it-yourself approach, as Carrie mentioned, you can email hello at managedsalespros.com and request a copy of their free ebook on cold calling for MSPs. Again, that book is free, so uh, a couple of you during the session have asked if there's a charge for it, and there's not. So uh, go ahead and email uh, hello at managedsalespros.com. It certainly couldn't hurt to get that book and have a look at it and see what you can do to improve your, your cold call process. And last but certainly not least, Autotask whose integrated IT business management platform can help to automate and optimize the entire client life cycle while helping MSPs like you generate revenue and secure your clients for life. To learn more about Autotask, you can visit autotask.com or contact them using the info on your screen. And be sure to mention the Intronus webinar special, which will give new and existing customers, that's right, new and if you're already an existing Autotask customer, you can use that Intronus webinar special uh, essentially, it's a coupon code. You email them or, or give them a call and mention that, and you should access some significant discounts off their dashboards and such. So um, thanks again to Intronus, Autotask, and Managed Sales Pros, uh, and to Carrie and John for a great presentation. And now we'll dive right into your questions. So the first question, uh, in fact, two, two people, looks like John and um, Robert, have both asked a question along the lines of uh, sort of cold calling versus physical calling or knocking on doors. So Carrie or, or Jonathan, do you guys have any thoughts on sort of how cold calling uh, and, and the advice you've given today might relate to knocking on a door? And if that's really not your, your sweet spot, then that's perfectly reasonable as well. But, but how do you think sort of the knocking on doors approach compares to the cold calling piece? I think it depends on what you're going to bring with you knocking on doors. So if you're just going to show up in their office trying to get time from somebody, that's a little more intrusive than a phone call. But, you know, if you brought donuts, I probably would take that call. <laughs> yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a funny point and, 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 a, and a fair point. Uh, Jonathan, any thoughts on knocking on doors uh, versus cold calling? Um, it's not something that I've ever personally done. Um, however, I think a lot of the takeaway points that uh, Carrie and I went over here today um, could definitely be applied to maybe knocking on a door. Um, I mean, obviously, you still want to ask the open-ended questions, and you know, a lot of those objections, you're, you're going to be getting the same ones, uh, I would assume, like I said, maybe not from personal experience, but um, I think it's very comparable, um, but you have to be a little bit more comfortable than just using your voice, obviously. Thanks, John. Um, there's a question here from John, not you, John, another John on the call here asks, what about salespeople that are unintentionally loud? I'll start with you, Carrie. Any advice on volume skills for folks that just have loud voices, how they can temper that or how that plays in? I am unintentionally loud, so I can totally relate to that. Um, now, I mean, that question, I'm, that's a hard question to answer because I don't know if they're asking how do we encourage our sales reps to speak differently? Or if somebody's calling you, is there a polite way to say, hey, buddy, tone it down a bit? But again, that technique we talked about earlier where you play, like, call, call, your, call your pitch into an answering machine. Or if you're, um, if you're a voice over IP system, if you're using a telephony system that has the ability to record outbound calls, 
just play those back for the sales rep. They should be able to see where they're losing ground in conversations based on the fact that their voice is so loud and overwhelming. Okay, thanks. Jonathan, anything in your, in your experience about volume control? I would pretty much say the same thing. I mean, there's definitely, I can think of a few people that, uh, after hearing that question, uh, that are in our sales office that might, uh, by chance, talk a little loud or um, breathing loud is another thing. Uh, if you're using a headset, it's very easy and, you know, just work with it. Um, I mean, try to, you know, call into a friend or something and just have a 10, 15 minute conversation with them. If they're breathing heavy or they're talking too loud, just move the microphone. Maybe shut off uh, a little bit of the, the volume on the mic. Um, you know, it's kind of just a trial and error, I would say, because it's definitely something that uh, you want to be cognizant about. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. A lot of questions coming in. And folks, please continue to send your questions in. We'll answer as many as we can on the call live today. For those that we don't answer, we'll do our best to follow up one-on-one -on -one with you. So uh, please go ahead and keep them coming. Uh, one of the people on the call, this, uh, this comes from Brian, he's asking where are the MSPs that are on the webinar located? So I'll just take that one. Brian, it's, uh, you know, typically our audience is made up of uh, a lot of Intronus partners and folks that are looking at Intronus uh, and also folks that have, you know, worked with or, or inquired about managed sales pros and in this case Autotask. So typically I would say most of that is the United States and Canada. Um, so that's, that's the best I can tell you there. Um, Let's see, we've got a question about pros and cons of paying a lead generation company on a per dollar per lead versus dollar per hour or flat fee per month. So, uh, <laughs> Kelly, what's best for you? All right, so obviously I am, uh, I'm going to be biased because we charge a flat rate, so I want to be totally open to that before I tell you why I think that's the best way to do it. And we have tried both, so when we first started our business to start winning more business we offered that per lead um, program and what we learned is that when people are only buying leads they're missing about 90 percent of the sales process so if you're going to buy a lead from a company or let's call it an appointment from a company for a thousand bucks a pop what you're not learning is what happened on the 319 calls that we made prior to scheduling that appointment and a lot of times companies say we don't care about that we just want the meetings but I would argue that the data on those 300 calls before that meeting is the stuff that you're going to need to grow your sales pipeline. So you're going to learn who's winning the business that you want. When are their contracts expiring? How much are they spending? Like You're going to be able to create a really robust sales pipeline with all of that data, whereas when you're buying leads, you don't get any of that. So buying um, a set rate calling program is really like asking the cold calling company to show their work. So a lot of times when people say, oh, well, I, you know, I only want the leads, I only want the leads, would you be comfortable paying $1,000 a lead for every lead that gets deposited into your lead account from that firm? And what if it only takes that company 10 calls to get those leads? Are you still comfortable paying $10,000 for 10 phone calls? So that's something to consider. And the one thing that we've noticed here is for when we were originally incenting our callers to get meetings, they scheduled some meetings that nobody wanted to go to. So I think when you're only paying for performance, you end up with a lot of leads that may not have been calendared otherwise. So when our team is working on leads, like they have to go through a very stringent qualification process, and that meeting has to go to their supervisor, and the supervisor has to say, yeah, that's a lead, before it even gets tabled for our client. If you're paying per lead, I'm going to guarantee you that some of the leads that end up on your desk, you're not going to want. Okay, thanks, Carrie. That's uh, I think it's a great response and a, a fair one, considering you <laughs> you obviously do have some bias. But, We're better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate that insight. Um, you know, we've uh, one thing that, that I just want to point out is that we have been mentioning Autotask quite a bit, and someone asks uh, Alan asks, what about ConnectWise? Well, we have integrations with both Autotask and ConnectWise in terms of you know our product side. Introvis is deeply integrated into both of those platforms, so. We don't have any particular bias one way or another. It's just that this webinar happens to be co-sponsored by Autotask. So we appreciate their support in presenting this to you today. And, and that's, that's merely where that comes from. Um, so if you use ConnectWise, you can integrate with Intronus. And I certainly don't necessarily have anything bad to say about ConnectWise. I think it's a great tool. So, um, so that's that. 
Uh, let's see. We've got someone who asks, look, Charles wants to know, if you have recommendations for sales team members that are getting passed on to IT staff as opposed to a gatekeeper or decision maker. So they call a decision maker, get a gatekeeper, and then they get passed on to IT staff. Yeah, you're going to get passed on to them all the time. And we have a whole chapter of that book devoted to how do you pitch IT. And really what we say is meet with the IT department and find out what's really going on there. You don't have to bid on this business. You don't have to ask for this business. But why wouldn't you go meet with somebody who's stuck in the middle of it to learn how to pitch properly to, at the CEO level? Once the IT department you know, lifts up the kilt and shows you what's going on there, you're going to be able to easily identify what's going wrong. I say just meet with them and then go above their heads to the next person and say, here are the issues that we've identified and here's how we think you should solve them. I want to encourage people here to not become consultants for free, though. Like Your time is valuable. Don't go providing network health assessments to IT teams who are too lazy to do the work themselves. Go in there, learn as much as you can, build a case for a managed services contract, and then take that case to people that can get that done. Great. Thank you. Uh, looks like we've got a question here from Kurt. How much time do you spend finding contacts prior to calling the company? None. That's it. Well, Shall I elaborate? Contacts, right? I think you should because be, right away I'm going, well, how do you know who to call? But, so go ahead. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, the contact isn't important because half the time everybody, there's not going to be the same to say, if, if, sorry. If you knew for certain 100% of the time that the controller was the decision maker at every organization that you called, then of course it would make sense to go and try and identify who the controller was so that you could call in and talk to them. But most often you're going to call into an organization, you're going to ask for, you know, Joe Smith, who is the controller, and the receptionist is going to say, what is this call regarding? And you're going to tell them and then they're going to not put you through anyway. So what we find works better than spending a lot of time researching, looking for contact names, call into the company and whoever picks up the phone is the person that you start to talk to and that's where you get the organization mapped. So when you call in and give your quick introductory pitch to that gatekeeper, they're going to tell you who you want to talk to. Then here's the best part is they're also going to tell you everything you want to know on how you should pitch that person. So you can qualify talking to a gatekeeper before you even talk to the decision maker. Are you going to waste the president's time asking him how many computers he has? Or are you going to prepare yourself for that conversation speaking to somebody else in the organization before you ask to be transferred to that person? If they only have 12 computers, you don't even want this lead. So try and aggressively qualify at the beginning and ask them to tell you who is making the decision. The more you can engage the gatekeeper in the process, the less likely it is that they're going to tell you to go away. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, it's a very fair point. I guess every organization is, is unique, so it makes a lot of sense, and it sounds like it could add some efficiencies to the, pro to the process. We've um, done the math on it, Jeff. So we, we've figured out that you can, if you had a full-time caller doing research before they called, that's a full eight hours of their week that they are not calling. So that's eight hours removed, and if you're dialing 25 times an hour and it takes 300 dials, like the, the number of people you don't talk to because you're looking for contact names on LinkedIn, it's astronomical. And if you times that by a sales force of 10, look how much productivity you're losing. Certainly makes sense. Uh, I've got a question here from Gene, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, Jonathan, I'll, I'll throw this one to you because I know it, it could probably apply to the work you do as well. Um, Although the Gene asks, uh, will will you guys share a best practice of overcoming the objection? We already have a contract with another MSP, so um, uh, that's one of the questions here. We we've already got a contact with another MSP, and they're trying to get off the call that way. What would you do? Um, to be honest, that one is is difficult in a lot of different ways. Um, if you are you know, for instance, if I call into a prospect, a, a managed service provider, and they just signed with a competitor of ours, they have a year contract. Most likely it's going to be a year or annually. Um, it is almost impossible to get that business that they've already signed up for. It's definitely something that you can talk to. Are you leaving any business off on the table um, as far as, 
you know, obviously you purchase the licensing or however the other vendor operates. But if you are looking at it in a different light, you know, what business have you lost? Or why did you go with this vendor um, outside of looking at ours? Why was the pricing better? Was the functionality better? Um, you can obviously, you know, if it is of interest to him to still, or her, excuse me, to look into your uh, solutions as well, um, by all means. He might not want to get off the phone with you, but for the ones that do, just ask, hey, when's the best time I can follow up with you? I understand, you know, you just signed on with another vendor that does the exact same things that we do, um, or maybe they don't. Follow it up with that. Um, maybe leave it a little bit open. You know, we do some things better, and, you know, so does your competitor. Not gonna, I even say that to a lot of prospects, too, you know. They do what they do well, and so do we. I have, you know, A, B, and C as collateral, really. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it helps. It sounds like it is a tricky situation, and uh, Kerry, it is because certainly, I certainly mean, let us know uh, how you think you might overcome that one. So the, the objection is we already have a contract with another MSP. Oh, well, that, we like to find out first of all when, like, if that's the objection, how long is the contract? And you won't you won't want to come right out and say how long is your contract, but. What we say is, that's, that's great. Tell me about why you signed that contract. What did they bring to the table that you appreciated? What got you excited about that opportunity? And have them, instead of them getting off the phone quickly, let them tell you how they made their purchasing decision, because that's going to tell you how to pitch that business again in a year. And if it turns out that they're nine months into a 12-month agreement, that's a perfect time to go in and review what you do, what they do, what can you do better. Great. So it sounds like both of you are looking to, you know, find one way or another, multiple means to the same end, but it sounds like you're trying to get at sort of what is the contract, why did you choose it, and when does it end? And it sounds like all that information would be valuable so that you know how to, you can sort of flag that as a, as a target you want to go after in X amount of months or, you know, they'll go back with right. a certain pitch based on what they liked about that vendor. So thank you guys. Exactly. Um, I appreciate that. Another question, and this is the same question from Gene, it, it, will you share best practice overcoming this objection? Our IT services are handled internally. Carrie, what do you mean by that? <laughs> that was, uh, okay, Jonathan, you go, go ahead, for Carrie. it. Okay. <laughs> um, the first thing I would say is, what do you mean by that? Let them open up. Um, so, for instance, one of our common objections is that they have their own data center. Okay. Um, what is the niche that you are, you know, selling your services towards? Is it you know, a certain price per gigabyte, do you not want to utilize some of the functionality within your own infrastructure? Um, is it something that having another service or having something else for your customers to choose from, would that open up doors to business that you're leaving on the table? That would probably be the best way that I have come across handling that objection. Uh, I don't know, Carrie, it might be a little bit different for you. Well, the first thing I want to find out is, do they have an IT guy or an IT team? If they have a full team of IT support, pitching this business is going to be uh, kind of an uphill battle. But if they've got one guy, it'll be easy for you to present uh, a compelling argument for using a company like yours. Better certifications, probably more recent certifications, um, experts in multiple things and not just one guy. So what you want to start presenting them with the reasons that using a team like yours would make sense. But the first thing I would do in that situation is ask to be transferred to that guy and talk to him. Like if you can find out from him that he is in fact overworked, they are understaffed, if you can learn what he doesn't know, you're going to be able to get the, the fuel that you need to really present a better business case to the president of the organization on why Manda service contract. And again, you don't have to displace the IT guy, although quite often people want to. If, they are, if there's one, I, one overwhelmed IT guy that you can help look like a rock star, he's going to champion you in through the organization. Yeah, that, that sounds like a very interesting point. Um, you know, it sounds like uh, it sounds like both of you are are you know looking to learn more about the IT person, uh, IT staff, and to to try to just you know it, it reminds me of what Carrie earlier when you talked about open-ended questions. You know what? Tell me about that, right? So you're trying to just learn more throughout the whole process, and I see that as a recurring theme. So that's interesting. 
Um, we've got a question here from John. What is the best info to leave in a cold call voicemail? That's a great question that I, I haven't heard a lot about today because voicemails probably come up, you know, I don't know, eight, nine other ten times, right? At least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe what do you do? So I like to use it like a little advertisement. The odds, and I'm going to tell you right now, in January we made 15,000 phone calls and we got three returned. But it doesn't, that's, when you think about, you know, you go to a trade show, for example, and you see someone multiple places and at multiple times, it's hard for a vendor to really measure where, what was it that tipped them. So every time you leave a message, leaving your name, leaving your company name, and then following up on your commitments promised at the time that you said that you would, Jonathan, you spoke to that earlier, to that persistence and how people appreciate it. When you tell someone that you're going to call them Thursday at 2 and you keep that commitment by calling them again Thursday at 2, you're giving them the opportunity to take that call at a time that's going to be, you know, that they can predict. But I would uh, just don't, don't put too much faith in getting those calls returned. I think it just helps them recognize your name the next time you call in and eventually, like, fine, fine, okay, I'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting response, Carrie. And Jonathan, I would absolutely love to hear yours. Um, unfortunately, we're really up against a wall here with time, but we've got so many great questions that came in today. So uh, folks are online. I really appreciate your participation and your engagement and all the great questions you've asked. We will reach out to those uh, who asked questions but uh, did not get those questions answered on air, and we'll try to answer those one-on-one. -on -one. I'd like to thank Carrie and thank John for their presentation today and, and for the Q&A session. And just remind all of you that Intronus, Autotask, and Managed Sales Pros are here to help drive your business forward. So contact info is right on the screen. Uh, in particular, I'd like to point out the ebook that Carrie mentioned. You can feel free to contact uh, hello at managedsalespros.com and request that ebook because I think it should certainly help get your efforts going. Um, and uh, you know, with Intronus, our contact info is there as well as Autotask. So don't forget to ask them about the Intronus webinar special. Uh, again, thanks, Carrie. Thanks, John. And thanks to all of you. And uh, I really appreciate your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day.